Uh, hi, my name is Johannes Thomsen. I'm working in the SUSE Labs file system team. Uh, my talk's uh, about authentication and verification of ButterFS, or how to secure the file system against offline data modification attacks. Uh, so for a background, why we want to secure the file system against any modification attacks is recently, or not so recently, Linux got more and more into the non-traditional data center deployments, like public cloud environment, mobile space, automotive space a lot, edge and IoT, which means there's no more physical access for the administrator of the Linux machine to the disks, but possibly physical access for an attacker. Um, so how could you do an offline attack to a file system. You could just, that's the easy way, just exchange the inode numbers of bin login, bin true, and there you go. Or just Troy and I's script setup, so your root is encrypted, all is good, but something has to decrypt it. Just swap out the normal crypt setup tool against your Troy and I's crypt setup tool, it'll skim the key, send it back to you. Or in a cloud image, you could just inject your SSH key and then people spin up the cloud image and yeah, you're good to go. Free root access. Or just corrupt some disk blocks and wait for it to crash. That's the easy one. Um, many, many, many more. So there's a lot of uh, attack surfaces for a file system. So, but the, what's ButterFS? So it's a general purpose file system. It has some neat features like snapshotting, transparent compression, integrated rate and de uh, logical volume management. It can do incremental backups where we are sent and receive, has sub volumes, and has checksum of all metadata. Well, XFS has that as well, if you configure it. And we have checksumming of all data. So it's well designed background about ButterFS. ButterFS is uh, built around copy and write B trees. And the B tree is a generic data structure used for nearly everything in ButterFS. It has three main internal structures, the block header, a key, and an item. Uh, the nodes in the key itself only contain uh, the keys and the pointer to the child nodes. And the leaves contain the, the items in the file system data. So here's normal node data structure with the header and uh, the rest of the items. Same goes for the leaf data structure. Coming to them is the header. And the header data structure has a checksum field right at the beginning, which is very convenient. It can be used to uh, to do the integrity checking if the, currently it's used if the block is corrupted by just rotting disks. Uh, but it can be, can be extended. And so the B trees are used for, for the root tree and the file system for the extend tree, chunks, the devices for RAID, subvolumes, quotas. Look, we, we have a lot of trees. And we have a checksum tree for all the data. So every data block gets checksummed, and that checksum is written into the checksum tree, and, and so on. So the first idea we had was, yeah, let's just replace that generic CRC we have with the SHA-256, and we're good to go. That sounded like an easy solution, but it turned out to be not that trivial, unfortunately. Well, an attacker could just redo all the file system operations with SHA-256 and they're, they're good again. So that would require a bit of a more advanced data structure like a Merkle tree. Uh, what's a Merkle tree? Not this Merkle tree. <laughs> it's the 
usual Merkle tree pun, I had to do that. Um, <laughs> but that Merkle tree. So Merkle tree is a data structure that uh, contains, well, it's a hash tree. It has it builds upon hashes, and each node is a hash of the hashes beneath it, and so on. So there's an end-to-end -end verification. It's like all the blockchain stuff is basically just this data structure. Um, so another solution we found uh, when discussing this, this changes was, yeah, we could use an HMAC. So what's an HMAC? Uh, for all your mouth nerds, and it's basically taking a hash of the block you want, having a key, hashing that key, XORing it together, doing a hash again, and we're good. So, first of all, we would need a, on file system creation time, we would need a key. So when you run MakeFS, you supply the key, and then MakeFS does all the HMAC calculations for all the file system structures. Um, on the mount time, of course, you need the key as well, it's, or unless it's read only. Uh, and the attacker would need the key for any data modification that should go un in unnoticed. Uh, we I'm pretty fast. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I was. <coughs> It's not on. Okay, yeah, hello? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I have a question. So kind of what is the, the treat model here? Yeah? What do you want to defend against? So that basically governs what is going to be the solution. Because like, like I understand, for example, this is this is the idea that there there are uh, there are actually patches for XT4 to implement Merkle three, and that's aimed basically also at kind of so you build a read Merkle three for a file, and that file is read only because that's useful for some Android stuff, yeah, but where where basically they want to encrypt the file, install it on or distribute it to Android devices, and then make sure it cannot get tempered with. So that's that's one of the use cases that's saying, and there it is, like the treat model is very clear. Here I am kind of missing like the detailed treat model that would that should then kind of guide the design. So, so the the planned threat model from from us and the SUSE perspective would be clearly the, the embedded and automotive markets where we sell our operating system, they deploy to their embedded device and for the automotive market, maybe so the, all the chip tuners kind of modify the data on the device, so they would okay. boot it, run a scrub job, and the scrub job sees, okay, that config file for your engine control yeah, so, has so been modified, we just don't stop the car. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, that means that read-only would be enough in your case, It for example. would be enough, but read-only there's enough existing read-only solutions, and with ButterFS, we could actually do it read-write. Because we have the checksumming of the metadata and the data. So it would be Except slower. Except that secret, and that secret has to be somehow secret so that the attacker cannot easily exactly, run it from the running kernel. We, we have a lot of secrets in the kernel. We have the kernel key ring. We okay. could just do a request key from inside the file system and get that secret. We could store the secret in a TPM module. Oh, okay, so so that's the idea. Okay, thank you. Exactly, it could be read only. It doesn't have to be. And from all the from all the related work uh, that there is, it's basically most of them like DM Verity, FS Verity, are uh, pure read only solutions for the problem. I think UBIFS is read write. But UBIFS, yeah, it's it's read write. Uh, I'm not so sure about CFS. They claim to have a Merkle tree. Uh, 
it's read, it's read write, and they claim to have a Merkle tree, but uh, I haven't looked at the source code. Only for integrity, okay. So, and IMA is hiding the, the hashes in an extended attribute. That doesn't sound like a too clever model either. So, that was a very quick, uh, the mic. So usually when we are talking about some uh, security improvements, uh, we need to forget about the performance. So w w what what are the numbers? Uh, is that rule uh, applied here or not? So uh, we have don't have any numbers yet. The it's not completely done. I'm still missing the HMAC part. Actually, we I just have the generic uh, hash infrastructure in the kernel now. Just that's and need a request key in the HMAC. Like two patches, two two three patches more. Hopefully. Depends on your hardware. If you have some some hardware accelerators that do the HMAC calculations for you, it's a completely different thing than if you have some like crappy ARM uh, MMU-less <laughs> power optimized. Power optimized. Uh. <laughs> I, use the microphone, but also I'm here. Anyway. Uh, so your, you know, the threat model as you just described is things like read-only or car motive and then releasing a secret in. Isn't this kind of what disk encryption is for and things like measured boot and getting things from secure boot and these things? Yeah, but so disk encryption doesn't protect you from, uh, but you from still modification. It's just encrypted. True, but it's you're still, it's still a framework which is releasing secrets and then providing secrets into this system. Well, it seems, this seems like... The, the Exactly, yeah. you, you need a key, and uh, the, the key part is the same, at least from the, the code part. But weren't you saying that you wanted to do this as read-write, so? Yes. So if an attacker can get the encryption key from their car firmware, they can then read-write stuff. If the attacker can get a, read, a key out of their car firmware, they can read-write BTRFS even though there's no encryption. So aren't these really a, trying to defend from the same thing? They're no, trying to defend them offline if, attacks. If, if you just encrypt, you could still corrupt any blocks and attack the file system that way. You, if you more or less know how the block for uh, the directory entry looks like, you could swap the inode numbers. Okay. So encryption, you can end up corrupting the data when you write it back. Don't, don't you, have multiple you need to say it into the microphone for the recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... I'm not sure this mic is working at all. Uh, okay, um, so is it correct to assume that the, the changes to make this work are all limited to like better FS checksumming part? Exactly. So it's only basically changing the, the checksum so that you have tempering detection now instead of just verification of corruption. Exactly. Okay. So performance-wise, well, performance-wise, you going have to either calculate a CRC32 or an HMAC. So HMAC is substantially slower than a CRC32, probably. Yes. Unless CRC you could, uh, CRC32C is rather fast. Yeah, no, it is. But is it enough to do exactly that kind of detection, tempering detection? Uh, for for a whole temporary detection, you need to scrub the whole file system to to read all the CRCs and all the data. Uh, <coughs> just a, a minor point: if performance is really a, a, an issue, I mean, we talked about it yesterday, but GCM mode uh, is a Wegman Carter mode, uh, which basically gives you a, um, all the uh, resistance that you would expect out of the HMAC, and you should be able to do that at multi, <coughs> sorry, multi gigabytes per second easily with uh, AS and I. So, yeah, um, we I think we we need to benchmark which exactly which HMAC or GMAC whatever we have to use. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I need to go back to the key question. So it's really a question, how do we get this key? So in your attack scenario, where you want to avoid car modifiers to work on 
they have, I mean, the car needs to boot with a key. And so they the also have access to this key. So this is really the, the base question of how to define this in a thread model that um, we can get the key from somewhere that is not accessible to the key. The key modifiers. could be stored in a, in a TPM module or some secure enclave. Yeah. Car hackers read stuff off the bus all the time. They're just going to sniff that when it's transferred electronically. I know people who do this. They're just going to get that key. Like it's a lo you're screaming into the void. It's a losing battle. Like, you know, like there's no way to get the key securely into the kernel in the first place. So like, isn't every solution here kind of flawed? Probably, if if you have no way to securely have the key somewhere inside the silicon, whatever, then yeah, but. I have, a, I have a thing that will make you laugh. So all cars are online these days. Just do online verification or something. Yeah, just do is, of course, over, <laughs> overdone. But um, if you want to do it, I mean, if you have this integrated system, then we can envision some kind of trusted compute style online check. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, that's the more or less the system deployer's task. How to get the key will. So now if I understand the solution well, you have no way to differentiate from a benign or a hardware problem, corruption due to the hardware, a bad sector, say, from yep. uh, an attack. Exactly. So how do you... No, that wouldn't be necessarily. But the thing is, where would be the difference between a corrupted sector and an attack? Well, the one... A bad sector, you can probably repair it. But an attack, you may want to do different forensic to know what the attacker was trying to do. It, it depends on uh, on your use cases. If you're in some data center environment and you probably have have to deal with your your threat model is corrupted disk blocks, then you'll probably are good with some CRC, XX hash, whatever checksum to find corrupted disk blocks. Or if you're in an embedded environment where you want to have or on your laptop, go to cust through customs, and you get your laptop seized. Uh, you want to detect implants or something like that, then that model would be good. I mean, um, his point, the point of Damien, was that um, you might have different threat models or different failures cases, which would need to be considered at the same time. Because it is well feasible that there will be corrupted di uh, blocks, <laughs> especially if you run on crappy hardware, like or non-crappy car hardware, but still might evolve car uh, failures. And your addition might have an attack. So you would actually need to consider both. But then the question really is whether it needs to be considered in this context or whether it can't be delegated to some other things. Because if exactly. you have known crappy hardware, maybe invest on whatever redundancy on the hardware level to avoid these kind of failures. Exactly. Uh, my question is rather related to this all, but uh, do you have any evidence or are you aware, aware of attacks of, of this class or this is just a future-proof research implementation? Uh. Because uh, um, in my point of view, from a security standpoint, this would be the last level uh, an attacker would look at, uh, especially in IoT. Uh, probably, but old. I have found a paper somewhere. I actually wanted to, to link it in the presentation. I couldn't find it anymore about someone crafting a USB stick purposely to attack the forensics workstation of the police to and erase all data on the forensics workstation. Um, and this is not so much about an actual attack, this is about um, provability. And so that you can prove Why that you can check. Right, I still, so basically, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit hard to talk to someone who's not in front of you because then it's so, so. No problem. right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> he ignore him. So who is him? Yeah. That's innovative. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, it is more about the fact that you can prove that the system has not been tampered with, because that is something which you need if you want to undergo any certification. So the data that you are writing to disk, the checksumming, right? Is that really only the checksum field in the header? 
which is like 16 bits, right? Or, or no, it's 32. 32 bits. It's 32 bytes. So the the CRC field in the header is 32, 32 bytes? bytes. Yeah. Okay, then call checks on that CRC. Consider me not having a question. <laughs> So that's why we have a limitation for hashes of uh, uh, 256 bit hashes, which is kind of a bit weak, but it's, it's a still okay enough, I think, I hope. Yeah. For now, yeah. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Then I was asked to give an announcement about lunch. Lunch will be served uh, downstairs where the uh, breakfast was. Okay, thank you.